Hello everyone! This video is entitled Lewis Structures. Created by American physical chemist Gilbert Newton Lewis in 1916, these structures allow us to visualize how ionic and covalent bonds are formed through the process of electron transfer or sharing. In this video, I will show you how to properly draw ionic compounds and covalent compounds that may require either double or triple bonds. Okay, let's get started. Let's begin by discussing why the drawing of Lewis structures are so important. Chemical bonding involves the interaction of valence electrons. These are the electrons that occupy the outermost energy level of an atom. Lewis structures were created to represent the atoms in chemical bonding. There are four specific rules for drawing out Lewis structures, or what we call Lewis dot diagrams. The first, Replace an atom's nucleus and inner electrons with its atomic symbol. The second, add dots around the atomic symbol to symbolize the atom's valence electrons. The third, place the dots starting at the top of the atomic symbol and continue adding dots around the atomic symbol clockwise to the right. And the fourth, after you've added the first four dots around the atomic symbol, Begin again at the top by doubling up. The example I have here is of nitrogen. To begin, I drew the atomic symbol of nitrogen and I added the first electron or the first valence electron dot at the top and I continued adding dots around the symbol for nitrogen going clockwise until I reached the top again where I doubled up. I stopped at five valence electrons because nitrogen is in group 15, which only has five valence electrons. The convention for showing more electrons is as follows. Here I have period three elements, and they're written now as they would be on the periodic table from left to right. I start with sodium and I go all the way to argon. Now each one of these elements has its respective amount of valence electrons based on the group that those elements are in. Now, Due to large differences in electronegativity, metals in groups 1 and 2 often form ionic compounds with nonmetals in groups 13 to 17. This makes sense considering that group 1 and 2 metals are very desperate to lose electrons, while group 13 to 17 nonmetals are very keen on gaining electrons to reach a level of stability. Through bonding, the atoms of each element obtain a full octet of electrons, equivalent to that of the nearest noble gas. Remember, these elements want to become isoelectronic with the nearest stable element, which would be a noble gas. The example of bonding I have here is for magnesium fluoride. We know that the chemical formula of magnesium fluoride will be written as MgF2 because of the crossover rule. As I showed you in previous lectures, this of course occurs because magnesium needs to lose two electrons to become stable, while each fluorine atom needs to gain one electron to achieve a full octet. This creates two fluorine ions and one magnesium ion. Each fluorine ion will have one negative charge because each one has gained an electron, and the magnesium ion will have a two positive charge because it has lost two electrons. Using Lewis dot diagrams, we represent the movement of these electrons as shown here. The first electron will go to one atom and the second to another. This creates two fluorine ions and one magnesium ion. Now, this portion of the Lewis dot diagram representation is not something that you actually need to know how to draw. It is just provided here for a better understanding. Now, this section here is something that you do need to know how to draw, okay? This is the proper representation of an ionic compound using Lewis dot diagrams. And so what I have drawn is a magnesium ion sandwiched in between two fluorine ions. Now, you could represent this type of ionic compound in a different way. You could draw one fluorine ion 
with a large coefficient of 2 uh, as a precursor before it to represent that you have two fluorine ions bonding to one magnesium ion. What's important to note is that either one of these illustrations, this one or the one before, are both formal and proper representations of Lewis structures for ionic compounds. Let's look at some practice questions. You'll notice that some of these examples are easier than others. And so if we take a look at sodium chloride, you'll notice that this is a much easier example to write out Lewis structures. Um, this ionic compound, again, has a representation of the movement of electrons, uh, where sodium loses an electron to the chlorine atom, and it creates these two ion structures. For calcium fluoride, we have a very similar example to that of magnesium fluoride, where the calcium ion is formed by losing two electrons, one to each fluorine atom, to create two fluorine ions. The last example is where it becomes a little complicated. Now we have three magnesium atoms forming a bond with two nitrogen atoms. Um, and so the representation becomes pretty jarring to look at where each nitrogen atom is taking three electrons, two from one magnesium and one from another magnesium and the same beneath. So this representation becomes very, very confusing to look at. That's why it's not very prudent for you to understand how to draw these types of representations. It's very important to know how to draw these representations. And so we know because of the crossover rule that magnesium is going to have three ions and nitrogen is going to have two ions with a three negative charge and a two positive charge respectively. Here are two more practice questions to show a visualization of the formation of ionic compounds using Lewis structures. Example number one is of iron three oxide. And so you can see that there are two iron ions for every three oxygen ions. And to the left of that representation, you have the representation for the movement of those electrons. Now, this again is jarring, but very important for those who want to understand where those electrons are coming from and why we actually have three oxygen for every two iron. The example beneath is of iron two chloride. Now this is an easier example because there's only one iron ion for every two chlorine ions. And so the representation for the movement of electrons is actually quite easy to understand. The drawing of Lewis structures for covalent compounds happens to be quite a bit more complex than that of ionic compounds. Remember that dots can be used in between atoms to represent bonding pairs. It can also be represented with the use of lines to indicate single, double, or triple bonds. The dots then would be reserved for the use of lone pairs or non-bonding pairs represented on the peripheral atoms or the central atom if there are any. This here is an image that shows exemplars of many different kinds of compounds. Now you can see that there are simple ionic representations with Lewis structures, and then there are very complex examples. And so this one would be a very complex example of a network solid um, of a covalent compound involving aluminum and chlorine. And remember, aluminum a metal, chlorine a nonmetal can still form covalent compounds based on differences in electronegativity. So our aim is to learn how to draw these types of compounds, not so much um, network solids, those are a little bit more complex, but uh, these compounds here where you have central atoms surrounded by peripheral atoms and determining when you would use single bonds and when you would use double bonds. There are eight specific rules for drawing the formation of covalent compounds. Let's dive into that. The first rule for drawing covalent Lewis structures is to arrange the symbols of the elements by placing the atom or atoms, the lowest electronegativity in the center of your covalent drawing. Here are three examples. And in these three examples, it makes sense that the carbon, sulfur, and nitrogen would be the central elements. It of course makes sense that the one nitrogen atom would be surrounded by the four hydrogen atoms. It becomes really complicated when you have more than one central atom. 
So in the previous slide, I showed examples where you might have more than one central atom surrounded by quite a few peripheral atoms. And so in that situation, it becomes prudent to really remember that the lowest electronegativity atoms are the ones that go in the center of your compound. The second rule is to add the valence electrons available together, and you must always remember to add one electron for a negative charge on your compound and remove one electron for a positive charge. Remember that a negative charge means that that compound has gained an electron, and a positive charge means your compound has lost an electron. So for carbon dioxide, carbon has four electrons in its valence shell. Oxygen has six, but because I have two oxygen, I'm multiplying it by two. I add this together. I have a total of 16 electrons I can use in my covalent drawing. I did the same thing for sulfur trioxide, but when it came to the ammonium ion, instead of having nine, which is what my addition should provide me, I subtracted one electron because of the positive charge, leaving me with a total of eight electrons to work with. The third rule is to place a pair of electrons between each adjacent element. This represents the single bonds that are gonna be formed between these atoms. So if we go back to our examples, for carbon dioxide, I place a pair of electrons between each peripheral atom and the central atom. So this represents a bond between the, the oxygen atom and the carbon atom on either side. I did the same thing for sulfur trioxide and for the ammonium ion. I then take the remaining electrons and I place them around the peripheral atoms as lone pairs. Remember, the peripheral atoms are the atoms surrounding the central atom. And so if you remember, for carbon dioxide, I had a total of 16 electrons to work with. And that's from rule number two. I used four of those electrons to bind to the central atom. The remainder are gonna be placed on the peripheral atoms. And so two, four, six, two, four, six, that gives me 12 electrons, 12 plus four, 16 electrons. And so that's the total number of electrons I had allotted to me to work with. If you add up all the electrons for sulfur trioxide, you'll find that it all equals to 24 as well. And here are my eight electrons that I have available for my ammonium ion. The fifth rule relates to the ever handy octet rule. If I have a central atom that does not have a complete octet of electrons, I need to move lone pairs from the peripheral atoms to the central atom to stabilize it. If I take a look at my examples, for carbon dioxide, carbon has four electrons surrounding it, which means it's unstable because it doesn't have a complete octet. That implies I need to move a pair of electrons from each of these oxygen atoms inward to share with carbon so that it stabilizes. Sulfur has a similar situation where it has six electrons and it needs another pair. The additional pair can come from any one of these oxygen atoms. It doesn't matter which one, but we know that one of these oxygen atoms is going to share another pair of electrons with sulfur to stabilize it. Nitrogen is actually stable because it has eight electrons. Now, some of you may be wondering, how is it that the hydrogens are stable? They apparently only have two electrons. Well, that actually makes sense because hydrogen is in period one. And because they're in period one, they only need two electrons to become stable. If we now add those electrons inward, the images have changed. And so if you take a look at the oxygen atoms, a pair of electrons has been moved inward from each oxygen atom. Now, these oxygens haven't lost the electrons. They're now just sharing more electrons with carbon. In fact, this is what a double bond looks like. A single bond is just a single pair of electrons being shared between two atoms, but now we have two pairs. And so carbon dioxide actually has two double bonds occurring between both oxygen atoms and the carbon. Whereas in sulfur trioxide, I have one double bond happening between one of the oxygen atoms and the sulfur atom. It doesn't matter which oxygen atom forms the double bond, we just know that one of those oxygen atoms is forming a double bond. And of course, ammonium has remained unchanged. The next rule is to count the number of bonds between the central atom and the peripheral atoms. If the bonding capacity of the central atom is exceeded, 
that means that one or two or three of its bonds are now coordinate covalent bonds. So if you take a look at sulfur trioxide, sulfur, because it's in period 16, should only be able to form two bonds. Because it has six electrons in its outer shell, it only needs two more, and so it needs to share with two other atoms. Because it's forming potentially four bonds, two with this oxygen, one with this oxygen, and one with this oxygen, that means that it's exceeded its bonding capacity by two, which means that two of its bonds are coordinate covalent bonds. Now you must keep in mind that double bonds can never be coordinate covalent bonds. Single bonds are the only types of coordinate covalent bonds. And remember, a coordinate covalent bond is where the central atom has donated an electron to a peripheral atom, and then that peripheral atom came back and shared it. With the ammonium ion, nitrogen is in period 15, which means it potentially can only form three bonds. Here it's forming four bonds with four different hydrogen atoms, which implies that one of those bonds must be a coordinate covalent bond. Rules number seven and eight allow us to add the finishing touches to our covalent Lewis structures. Rule number seven is to replace all the bonds with lines. And so because we have double bonds between the carbon and oxygen atoms in carbon dioxide, I have two double lines connecting the carbon and the oxygens. The same thing can be said about sulfur trioxide where I have a double bond and two single bonds, and then I have four single bonds with the ammonium ion. Rule number eight, if the molecule has an overall charge, you place brackets around the entirety of the molecule and you add the charge to it. And so carbon dioxide and sulfur trioxide remain unchanged because they are not ions, but the ammonium ion is a positively charged ion. And so I place it in brackets and I put an overall positive charge. And now I have three complete sets of covalent Lewis structures. Here are some practice questions for drawing Lewis structures. Although I have provided the answers to these questions within the slide, I strongly recommend that you try drawing the structures first before glancing at the answers. Only use the answers as a reference to make sure that you're doing the questions correctly. Some of these questions will be slightly easier than others. Some you might find quite difficult. So again, only look at the answers after you've tried your hand at the questions. And with this slide, I conclude this package and this lecture. I hope you understood everything I discussed today. Thank you for listening. All the best.